The Psychology of the Religion Making Process On January 5th, 1922, Joan had a conversation with his soul concerning his vocation. She urged him to publish his material as it was a matter of revelation. He had to serve his calling, which was the new religion and its proclamation. He balked at this. Three days later, his soul informed him that the new religion expresses itself vis visibly only in the transformation of human relations. Relations do not let themselves be replaced even by the deepest human knowledge. Moreover, a religion doesn't consist only in knowledge, but at its visible level in a new ordering of human affairs. Therefore, expect no further knowledge from me. You know everything that is to be known from the revelation offered to you, but you are not yet living out everything that is to be lived at this time. Jung's eye replied, I can well understand and accept this, however, just how the knowledge could be implemented in life is dark to me. You must teach me this. His soul said, There is not much to say about this. It is not as rational as you are inclined to think. The way is symbolic. During this period, an increasing number of people from England and America made their way to Zurich to work with Jung, forming an informal expatriate group. On August 22nd of 1922, Jamie the Angulo wrote to Chauncey Goodrich, issuing a challenge to all brothers neurotics, go my brethren, go to the Mecca, I mean to Zurich, and drink from the fountain of life. All ye who are dead in your souls, go and seek new life. In 1922, Jung wrote a paper on the relation of analytical psychology to literary works. He differentiated two types of work. The first, which sprang entirely from the author's intention, and the second, which sees the author. Examples of the latter were Nietzsche's Zarathustra and the second part of Goethe's Faust, Faust. He held that these works stemmed from the collective unconscious. In such cases, the creative process consisted of the unconscious activation of an archetypal image. The archetypes released in us the archetypes released in us a voice that was stronger than our own. Whoever speaks in primordial images speaks with a thousand voices. He enthralls and overpowers. He transmutes our personal destiny into the destiny of mankind and evokes in us all those beneficent forces that ever and anon have enabled humanity to fight a refuge from every peril and to outlive the longest night. Artists who reproduced such works educated the spirit of the age and compensated the one-sidedness of the present. In describing the genesis of these symbolic works, it appears that Jung had his own activities in mind. Thus, while he refused to regard living novice as art, his reflections on its compositions were nevertheless a critical source of its subsequent conceptions and theories of art. The implicit question that this paper raised was whether psychology could now serve the function of educating the spirit of the age and compensating the one-sidedness of the present. From this period onward, Jung came to the conceive of the task of his psychology in precisely such a manner. On November 25th of 1922, Jung, Emma Jung, and Tony Wolf left the club. In July of 1923, Jung gave a series of seminars in Polzeeth, Cornwall, England. The Analytical Psychology Club in London had been founded the previous year. The seminar was organized by Peter Baines and Esther Hardin, and 29 people attended. Jung gave a dozen lectures over a fortnight. The seminar led to two main themes, the technique of analysis and the, histor the historical psychological effects of Christianity. 
During this period, the themes of the psychology of religion and the relationship between religion and psychology became increasingly prominent in Jung's work. He attempted to develop a psychology of the religion-making process. His interest lay not in proclaiming a new prophetic revelation, but in the psychology of religious experiences. The task was to depict the translation and transportation of the mount, the numinous experiences of individuals into symbols and eventually into the dogmas and creeds of organized religions. And finally, to study the psychological function of such symbols. For such a psychology of religious making process to succeed, it was essential that analytical psychology, while providing an affirmation of the religious attitude, did not succumb to becoming a creed. In Posey's, he drew a sharp distinction between the teaching of Christ and the ecclesiastical ecclesiastical Christianity. He argued that the attitudes of the latter had led to the psychological exclusion and repression of the world of nature and the flesh, the animal and the inferior man, and creative fantasy and freedom. Consequently, these matters were constellated in the unconscious and we were faced with the return of the repressed. Toward the end of the seminar, Jung reflected on the theme of the invisible church. While Christ had been a flame that had kindled the greater part of the world, this had been put out by the institutionalization of the church. He argued that such a process was inevitable and that the same fate lay in store for analysis. Reflecting on this, he noted, around Eckhart, grew up a group of brethren of the free spirit who lived licentiously. The problem we face we face is is analytic is analytical psychology in the same boat? Are the second generation like the brethren of the free spirit? If so, it is the open way to hell. And analytical psychology has come too soon and it will have to wait for a century or two. Religious experiences led to new forms of personal relation. Jung noted that no individual can exist without individual relationships. And that is how the foundation of, our ch of your church is laid. This then was the task that confronted analytical psychology to form an invisible church without succumbing to the institutionalization. Jung was also here drawing together the notion from liver novice that the appointed of this time was a God who would appear in the spirit as opposed to the flesh, through the spirit of men as the conceiving womb. As his soul had explained to him the previous year, this new religion would manifest itself through transformed human relations. Evidently, Jung's relation with his wife and Tony Wolf, the experimentum crept was related to this. Decades later, he would write, the unrelated human being lacks wholeness, for he can achieve wholeness only through the soul, and the soul cannot exist without its other side, which is always found in a you individuation required in a you. Individuation required conscious relationship. Following the Polzith seminar, Carrie D'Angelo wrote a paper on individual relationships. She began by noting, in the last two or three sessions of our summer school at Polzith, we discussed the possible contributions to be made by analytical psychology to the church of the future. We meant by this ill-omened word church, the inevitable form which will be assumed by the ideas of today that tend toward a new synthesis of subjective experience. The special contribution of analysis was thought to be the building up of the right sorts of relationships, both individual and collective, and the vision of a future in which one came into full self-expression through relationships instead of sulking 
engulfing into them, pinned by a thousand fears, was very enticing. As she saw it, for there to be real relations, a higher degree of consciousness than had here had hitherto been possible was necessary, and it was the task of analytical psychology to facilitate it. She proposed a written symposium on the subject and circulated her paper. Emma Jung wrote a response indicating that she was essentially in agreement but thought that further consideration needed to be given to the complications that arise when the principles should come to life. She highlighted the need for maximum of consciousness, mutual quality, and candor, describing unconsciousness as the only sin. The value of a relationship, she said, could be measured by the ability it has of making appear and live the individuality of the persons involved. For Jung and his close circle, such questions were existential as well as theoretical. On April 30, 1923, Eugene Schlegel, a lawyer and member of the club, recommended that the club try to involve Young again. A correspondence ensued later that year between Young and Alfonso Mieder in this regard, and Young's position was that he could return only if his collaboration was clearly and unanimously desired. There was heated discussion within the club. In February of 1924, Hans Trube stepped down as president and the letter was sent to Jung asking him to return, which he did a month later. In May of 1924, Jung gave a series of three lectures on analytical psychology and education in London under the auspices of the New Education Fellowship. The fellowship had been founded by Beatrice Ensor, a theosophical educationist. She had met Jung the previous year at the conference organized by the NEF on Education for Creative Service in Montreux, Montreux where he had spoken. In the mid-twenties, publication of Liver Novice seemed to have been one of the foremost issues in Young's mind. At the beginning of 1924, he asked Carrie Baines to make a fresh type transcription of the text and discuss the publication. She noted in her diary, So then you said I was to copy down the contents of the Red Book once before you had had it copied, but you had had since then added a great deal of material, so you wanted it done again and you would explain things to me as I went along for you understood nearly everything in it you said in this way we could come to discuss many things which never came up in my analysis and I could understand your ideas from the foundation Young discussed this Young discussed with his colleagues Wolfgang Stockmayer the form that publication might take. He went back to the corrected draft and edited it again, deleting and adding material on approximately 250 pages. His revision served to modernize the language and terminology. He also revised some of what he had already transcribed into the calligraphic volume of Liver Novice, as well as material that had been left out.